I have an awesome message today. Uh, this message is, is, as always, is given by the Holy Ghost. I thought I had my message by Wednesday, and as usual, this is how it is for me. The Lord gives me my messages backwards. <laughs> I can't work that out because I'm not, what's the word, dyslexic? But that's how I receive my messages. I get the end first and the beginning last. And it happens over a period oh, of days good. always. So really, <clears throat> there's probably three messages in one here. I don't think I'm going to get through it all. So I'll just be led by the Spirit. I'll cut off where I feel that you're all asleep and can't take it anymore. <laughs> um, no way. This is the most powerful message I have ever heard in my life. Me personally, from the Lord. Uh, this is going to open your eyes. I'll just dive into it. Um, to 17 is a pivotal year um, on God's time clock. And there's been, I've known fragments of what we're coming into, but as the Bible says, we <coughs> see in part. And what I'm finding, the Lord is starting to remove the veil more and more uh, so we can see more and more. And as I see more and more, I bring it to you so I know you will see more and more. You know, be encouraged. You're in the right place. I want to encourage you that by the end of this message, you're going to know that um, God has set you apart for a purpose. And it's amazing, the revelation knowledge I'm getting is just, it's, it's, all, it's almost constant at the moment. So, this is a pivotal year we're coming into, and the fulfillment of a convergence of three factors, which I want to tell you what they are. Um, the first one is the beginning of God's end time prophetic time clock. So, as we enter into 217, it is the beginning of God's end time prophetic prophetic time clock okay that's what 217 signifies it is the beginning of God's in time prophetic time clock number two it is the full measure of the cup of iniquity it is the full measure 217 of the cup of iniquity you know what that means when you get a cup and you fill it up there comes a point it overflows when it overflows the land cries out the earth speaks and God acts and we see that in the Old Covenant about the cup of... I can't go into the details in this. You're going to get a real blast of a picture today. And we'll have to try and fill the gaps at other times. The third one is a cry for freedom from slavery. Yes. A cry for, for freedom from slavery. From the church. Mm -hmm. From the land. From creation. Mm -hmm. 217 is a cry for freedom from slavery. The land has been enslaved. The people have been enslaved. And the cry for freedom will be heard in 217. Mm -hmm. okay? Israel's freedom from Egypt was dependent on the same three factors. Exactly the same. And they had to converge before God's plan, his final plan, could be carried out. God is a God of order and timing. And, and it's, he's not erratic. He doesn't respond um, irrationally. He doesn't respond, period. He's already got the time clock set. The thing is, the church needs to understand what his time clock is. That's what he's doing. He's opening our eyes. So the path to freedom is, number one, freedom from bondage. If we go back in to what we class the old covenant, um, the old covenant, the freedom from bondage was the freedom from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Now, when I talk about things like this, parallel the time we're in now to the time they were in there. Because the new covenant is only a fulfillment of the old covenant. Um, the second one is freedom from the wilderness, which is sin. So first, freedom from bondage, which is Egypt. That's when you get saved. The church has been freed from Egypt. The church. The thing that most of the church doesn't understand is there has to be freedom from the wilderness as well. You cannot enter into the promised land until you have passed through the wilderness. So although the church predominantly is saved, it hasn't acknowledged there is a period that we pass through 
before we enter in to the promised land. Now, where are we at at the moment? We're still in the wilderness, predominantly the church is still in the wilderness, which typifies sin. You can't go into the promised land till the sin issue is dealt with. It's not possible. So the church predominantly hasn't even got to the Jordan River yet. It's still deep into the wilderness. The, thir the third one is the path to freedom is working for the spoils, which is once you get in to the promised land. That's when you harvest the souls. That's when everything God has given us can be taken. All these scriptures we quote about what God's given us and we've got this and that, that's fine. We're, we're prophesying when we're declaring it, but the truth is most are not in that place. Number four is the reward for our obedience, which is the wedding feast and the rewards given out at that time. So very quickly, freedom from bondage, freedom from the wilderness, free, working for the spoils and reward for obedience. Now I want to say that we're probably predominantly stuck on number two as far as the church is concerned. There's a big shift coming and that's what this message is about. The big shift. The cup of iniquity is full and the earth itself is crying out for freedom from the weight of sin. Um, the cry for freedom can be seen in the earth itself and this is why we shall see a great rise in earthquakes of a great magnitude. Um, Jesus had the same insight that all of us can have, by the way. When he predicted there'd be earthquakes and famines, he understood this time that we're coming into, that the earth would be so full of sin that the earth would be reacting to that sin. And he said there'd be famine, there'd be war, there'd be disease. And these things are going to rapidly increase as of 217. I'm warning you because that's the purpose of our group. Most of my messages are prophetic and you, you need to listen to them with those ears. Put your prophetic hats on. This will be what God will allow to free mankind. So this trouble season we're coming into is what God is going to allow to free mankind from its bondage and look unto him. We can see it played out in our own group. I can see it played out in my own life over two years ago, where God allows almost catastrophic events to happen in order to shake our lives. And the purpose for that is, is to give us, because of his grace, the opportunity to press into him. The sad thing is, most aren't pressing into him at those times. They're running and trying to find comfort in other things be it drugs, alcohol, sex, relationships, religion, whatever. Busyness. Busyness is one of the greatest crimes on the earth today. And just like the plague God used on Egypt, once again, God will use the methods to release those in captivity. When you read the Old Covenant, read it as what's going to happen in the future. When God sent Moses into Egypt, to release them from slavery, God used him as a voice, but we know that they didn't want to listen to him, so God had to bring chaos onto the earth, or allow chaos to happen, and in this case, he will allow Satan to have a fling for three and a half years. So, the leaders that compromise God's word will cause many to fall in this period, sad to say. This is a hard message, but it's, I hope it will open some people's eyes. Because of this, a large mount will not make it and will die in the wilderness. I'm not going to sugarcoat what the Holy Spirit's given to me. <clears throat> the wilderness period after Egypt will need strong leadership. It has to have strong leaders. It cannot have people that will compromise not one thing. It has to have strong leaders. And those, those leaders will be people that God has set aside for this hour. And because of this, uh, I need to clarify something before I go on. Those who die in the wilderness, I'm not saying they're going to hell. Please hear what I'm saying. Don't ever think that. Mm -hmm. 
because we are not God. It's not our place to judge someone's salvation. And we're on dangerous ground when we do that. I believe that most will go on to be with the Lord. But we're not talking about that. I'm talking about the period we're coming into and what God has called you apart to do and requires of you and me. That's what I'm talking about. Um, this is a, we are an incredibly privileged people in this hour. We need to understand how privileged. You're going to see a little bit of this. It'll unfold for you soon. For those that do follow God's word, protection will be with them spiritually and physically. <laughs> those who have got ailments, I can tell you, you're not going to have them much longer. Amen. I could even give you a date, but I'm not a date setter, so I won't. But I can tell you, it's very close. You're not going to have any ailments in your bodies. Spiritually and naturally, physically, you are going to be protected by the cloud. Right. Obedience, confession and endurance to the end are the three keys. Obedience, confession and endurance are the three keys that will be required from all of us in this period. Um, be aware, the enemy is not going to let go easily. He is not going to let go. That is why I jump on things in our group and even outside of our group very, very quickly because I'm not going to let the enemy take our loved ones. I'm not going to allow that. And I encourage you to do the same. Um, be quick to jump on these things. Don't ignore it. Don't think God is going to sort it out. No, God has given us the job to sort things out. Yeah, We have to be a voice for him. And... Uh, be aware the enemy's not going to let go. The weapons he's going to use are three, unbelief, fear, and tiredness. I'll say it again, unbelief, fear, and tiredness. When you're tired, you can't pray when Jesus calls you to pray with him for an hour. You can't hear his voice because all you can hear is, I need rest. Busyness is a massive problem in the body of Christ at the moment. Distractions cause a lack of vigilance, and when there's a lack of vigilance, you are a target for the enemy. We need to realize, please, I, I beg of you, look after your bodies. Give yourself sufficient rest and sleep. Do not justify it, I had to do this. Forget <coughs> it. That material thing can wait till tomorrow. That visitation can wait till tomorrow. That preaching can wait till tomorrow. Look, God... We are, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and he has given us the commission to look after it's a sin not to do that. We've seen that play out in our group with our sister. I mean, that's the truth. And because she confessed it, God has healed her very rapidly. But that's what happens. So the deliverance from Egypt and the conquering of the promised land reveal two different levels of freedom. Get hold of this. Two different levels of freedom. Number one, freedom from slavery. Number two, possessing their inheritance. Now, there's two types of slavery. One is slavery when you are bound to go to hell. That means, in other words, I am not saved. If I am not saved, I am enslaved to sin. I cannot be free from that sin. That's the first type of slavery. The second type of slavery is the wilderness slavery, which is where you deal with your sin. The Egyptian, sorry, the Israelites had not dealt with their sin when they come out of Egypt. They had to deal with it in the wilderness. The problem is most of them didn't. And therefore they died in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Unbelief, fear, and they got weary. Remember what we're told, that if, if you don't get weary in due season. See? So, freedom from slavery, possessing the inheritance. You cannot possess your inheritance until you are free from the slavery of sin. Freedom from Egypt offers freedom from outward slavery, which is our salvation. The wilderness offers freedom from inward slavery, which is our sin. And the promised land offers the reward of the souls in the harvest, which is your eternal reward. And that's what matters. I had someone actually last night say to me, they felt they had wasted their life. I said, praise the Lord, it's not over. It's not over yet. You've still got a season in your life that we've all got. 
that's going to count. And it's this season we're coming into. This is the season of the harvest. This is the reward you're going to take to heaven. Forget about the last 80 years or 40 years and that. Yes. Don't let the devil use that to condemn you. That was your wilderness experience, like Moses. We all had them. We all needed them to learn from it. And mm. because of that, you've got something now that you can teach others with. And those who have been crying out for God's help from their sickness, their emotional pain, their poverty, their addictions, are going to be freed from these outward bondages as a sign in 2.17, as a sign that God is here, that he's arrived. This is a sign of the cloud. You're going to see a great revival of miracles and healing in 2.17. Right. The battle to conquer old mindsets is another issue. And this is where the church has to get a hold of it. Because the key to entering into the promised land is not getting healed from sickness. That's the icing on the cake. The key to entering the promised land is dealing with the sin issue. So there is a shift from the old guard to the new. Now I'm just going to step up into a totally different level here. Put your prophetic hats on. There is a shift from the old guard to the new. Every army has an elite group of soldiers. Every army has an elite group. When Iraq was taken in 24 hours, the success of that battle was because of 20 elite soldiers. And God trains an elite group. These soldiers have a special assignment. And because of their high level of discipline and commitment, they've been trained in specialized areas. They have special equipment. This is what we call the SAS, I think, in this country. I don't know, Mike, in the US. But this is a soldier that is different than the average soldier. Now, I'm going to take you somewhere here where the Holy Spirit's taken me. God's prepared a group of elite soldiers for this end time battle. Those elite soldiers have a special relationship with the Lamb of God. A special relationship. This is not a run-of-the-mill soldier. This is someone who is incredibly intimate with the Lamb. Everything I say will have multiple <sighs> alignments to the Word of God. This is not Martin speaking. Everything I say is in the Word of God, and you will see more than two or three witnesses on everything. This elite group is going to spearhead the greatest revival that the earth has ever known and will ever see. And this new breed of leader that God has already prepared, already. He is not preparing them. He has already prepared them, have been hidden away, in the wilderness for a season. They are the nobodies. They are the unknowns. Most of this elite group, nobody will have ever heard of them. God has hidden them away and prepared them in the wilderness by conquering all of those things that had kept them in bondage. All. There is nothing holding this elite group of leadership. Nothing. They are the elite of the elite. Please understand what I'm saying here. These leaders have a seal on them. And they will lead this last great battle as Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. God took Moses when he was in Egypt a prince, someone who had everything, had the greatest authority in the nation as a general, the highest ranking general in the Egyptian army. Mm. And he told him, I'm going to get you to take my people away. And Moses tried to do it in the flesh. Let's relate this to a pastor today. Mm. Moses tried to do it in the flesh and we know what happened. And Moses had to go and hide for a season. And God was in control of that. And he prepared Moses in that season. Then he sends him back to fulfill the job. But this time, Moses isn't doing it in the flesh anymore. He's doing it with the power of God. God's gone ahead of him. 
Mm. And in this season, that whole story is put in the Bible for you to understand this season we're coming into. It's not mm. a nice story. It is a parallel of what we're coming into in this season. The new breed of leader has already been prepared. Their lives are set apart, they're pure, they're holy. They're not defiled by the Babylonian woman. In other words, they are a virgin. I don't mean that in the natural sense. They have not been defiled by the Babylonian woman. They have conquered that sin. They have overcome the, the, the control of Babylon on their life. Mm. You understand where I'm speaking here? Mm. I'm speaking at a depth. I hope you understand. Simply put, these leaders have been sealed for this assignment. Those of you who know your Bible will know that that is in fact what the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation. Mm. Now, each one of us have been sealed. We're, we're coming into a time that we know that this other seal will take place called the mark of the beast. I don't believe it's an actual mark. I don't believe that. As God has a seal on each one of you, Satan also will have a seal to put on people. It will not be a visible seal. But the visible part will be what Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. You will know the ones that God has set apart by the fruit that's manifesting in their life in this season. There is going to be fruit that you won't be able to argue with. I'm going to really play with your minds a bit today. These leaders are sealed with the Holy Spirit as all of us are, but they also carry a special seal. I'm going to tell you what those seals are so you will be able to recognize them. Number one, the law of God. They are sealed with the law of God, the Word of God. They place a high priority on the Word of God above everything. They do not compromise the Word of God in anything, in any area. Mm. That's number one. Mm. They've been sealed with the Word of God. So they're sealed with the law of God and the prophets also. This new breed of leader is prophetic. They see into the spirit realm. They hear in the spirit realm. Mm. They're a double-edged sword. Prophecy and the Word of God. The two go hand in hand. Mm. You cannot separate the two to have a double-edged sword. <laughs> the third thing about this new breed of le leader. Oh, this is heavy, isn't it? This is... Mm. This is good. The third thing about, you'll notice with the seal on this person or people, is they've already entered the Sabbath. They've already entered into the rest. They have already entered. They are not trying to get there. They're already in that place. You cannot lead others when you haven't been in there yourself. Evidence of that is the 12 spies that went into Canaan. Only two mm -hmm. of them came back with a report and only two of them ended up ever going in. Mm -hmm. They had the seal of God on them, Joshua and Caleb. This leader is sealed because he's already entered the place of rest. So once again, he is sealed with the word of God, the law of God, which he will not compromise on to the point of death. Number two, he has a prophetic mantle on his life where he sees things that other people are not seeing. He sees into the spirit realm. He hears what God is saying. Jesus had this, Elijah had this, Enoch had this, Moses had this. And when Moses pulled aside to hear from God, although Moses had the Torah, the, 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 sorry, Moses had the, the law, the, the word of God, what Moses also had was the spirit of prophecy. So he is hearing God speak to him. And then he takes that and he gives it to the people. And it will always align with the word of God. Always. The word of prophecy always aligns with the word of God. The sign of the Sabbath in their life or the rest in this person's life is the sign that God has a mark on them which enables them no longer to work in their own strength. 
They no longer function under their own understanding. Mm. They're no longer led by man. It doesn't matter if you've got a theological degree. This person is not swayed at all. They see things only from heaven's perspectives. And that always aligns with the Word of God. The Word of God says, I gave them my Sabbath, that they may know as a sign between me and them that I am the Lord their God. That's Ezekiel verse, chapter 20, verse 12. I gave them my Sabbath, my rest, that they may know as a sign between me and them that I am the Lord their God. There is a sign for you that this person, these people, this, this, this new generation of leaders are sealed by God. They've already entered the rest. You can judge yourself those persons. You will know that person by those three things. Is this person hearing from God? Truly hearing from God? Has he had an encounter with the burning bush, in other words? Has she had an encounter with God that I know of in their life? Is there evidence of that encounter? Is there something that has happened that is a marker that that person has had that encounter? Number two, are they hearing from God? And that hearing from God will be fresh man. It will be new revelation every day, every day. And number three, are they living in a place of rest where nothing is rocking their lives? Doesn't matter what's happening or going on around them, they're not moved. These leaders hearing directly from God who follow the Lamb will be the ones leading the people through this season, this wilderness season ahead into the promised land. We need to take this serious. Those who didn't take Moses serious died in the wilderness. Align everything I'm saying with Scripture and take it away and, and seek the Lord over what I'm saying. These leaders have already gone ahead and have seen or spied out the promised land. They've already seen it. They know how to go there. They've been there already. They've, they've come back. And the reason they've come back is to give a report. We're going to make it. We're going to get in there and it's good. Mm -hmm. They have been there themselves. You cannot give what you don't have. Can you understand my mythology and right? Mm -hmm. um, they know the path. They've already travelled it. They know exactly what's ahead and how to combat the enemy. I'm not saying follow man. I'm saying follow God. Mm -hmm. The evidence who these leaders are, they've spent so much time, preparation in his presence, had an impersonal encounter, and they carry the spirit of the two witnesses. Now this is a level of revelation I want to open to you today. There's two witnesses spoken of in the end times that will come upon the earth. I have mm. struggled over who these two are for some time until the Lord opened my eyes late last night and gave me a revelation. I'm going to give you it and I know your eyes will be open straight away. The two is Elijah. We knew that. Elijah represented the prophets. He was the greatest of all prophets. And there's Moses. And Moses represents the law. He represents God's man, who God gave the law to. Mm. This is the two witnesses that will appear in this season. I'm talking about 217. 2017. This is not two literal people, so I'm just going to squash that right now. This is the spirit of Elijah. This is the spirit of Moses. This is a double-edged sword. This is the same two that met Jesus on the Mount Transfiguration. Mm. This is the two that held his hands up and supported him mm. in his greatest need, in his greatest hour of need. Mm. Mm.
great signs and wonders will follow these leaders. From the time of the final sealing of the Holy Spirit, you're going to see great signs and wonders happen. I'm not going to date set because people get offended with date setting. But let me take you back to the book of Acts, to the day of Pentecost, when Jesus said, don't do anything, wait. Mm. That's the message for you today and those who are hearing. Don't go out and try and win the world for Christ. Wait. 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 Because there is coming a day, and it's very soon next year. Mm. And the Spirit of God is going to reveal Himself once again. Mm. That will be the time that you will know that God is here. You're going to see what that early church saw. The fire that sat upon their, above their heads is the same fire that Elijah carried. Wait, in Jerusalem, by the way, who is Jerusalem today? The new Jerusalem is you and me. Wait until that day comes. Don't worry about anything. Mm -hmm. Because it's all about him from there on, because we know what happened with them after that. They went out. They went out all. And within one day, 3,000 were saved. Why? Because they are carrying something very, very special, very powerful. This is for you. This is not just for these leaders. This is for all who wait for that time. Mm. And I'm not saying you're not those leaders because that's God's business. But I think you already have evidence of, of what the signs are of those leaders. If they don't have those three signs, put a cross beside them. Don't follow what they're saying. It's dangerous. Mm. The timing of this will be when the final one has entered into the place of intimacy. Then suddenly this great outpouring is going to happen. I think you already can work out approximately the time frame if you know the Hebrew calendar. What do I mean by the final one comes into place? Well, on that day of Pentecost, there was 12 disciples bar one. His name was Judas. Judas had betrayed the Lord. And they were told to go and find a replacement for him. When the replacement came, that's when the Holy Spirit came. That's when the Holy Spirit came and this great outpouring happened. God is precise in his timing. So when, how many of these leaders are there in the world, I'm going to tell you soon. I think you know already. When that happens, when the final one comes in, that's the time that this great outpouring will happen. 217 is a pivotal year for us. Hmm. Literally, when the final one comes in, there's unity. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, it's complete. On the day of Pentecost, they were all together, all together, in one accord, and suddenly. So, two keys here, all together, meaning God will not run ahead of this. This has to be complete. The number of these leaders have to be complete. When it's complete, that then creates the unity that's needed to take the church through into the promised land. Mm. Mm. And literally there will be unity, they will be in unity with heaven, these leaders, a single focus knowing they've been called for this purpose. Just as the early apostles had to wait for Judas to be replaced before the fire of God fell in that upper room, this group of leaders are waiting for the number to be complete. There is a specific number. Do you know what it is? Because it's going to mess with your theology. There's 144,000 of the special number. And you say, no, that's all Jews. And I hate <laughs> to squash your theology. You're wrong. And you're right. 
because you are a Jew. <laughs> you see, what we have to do is interpret the Bible with open eyes, not religious eyes. And this 144,000 is spoken of in the book of Revelation. And despite this large misunderstanding in the Christian church about they are all Jews, we need to understand biblical evidence clearly proves otherwise. I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give you a little bit, but I don't want to dwell on this today. I can touch on it another time. James, the brother of Jesus, addresses this in chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of James. James, the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Enough said. Who is James addressing? Mm -hmm. The church, because he was in charge of the church. It was predominantly a Gentile church. James, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, this letter is going out to you, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. In other words, the Jews are scattered across the planet today. What is your history? Where do you come from? You go, are there Jews with this? No, you're not. This is where the church has missed it. Abraham is your father. Amen. If we go back into Genesis, somewhere around Genesis 12, 16, somewhere around that area, you will see that Abraham bore seed, and his seed uh, bore uh, Isaac, and Isaac bore Jacob, and Jacob bore the twelve, which are the twelve tribes. That Out of that twelve tribes, you are born. It's an interesting thing to look at, but I've never looked at this, but where do you connect into one of those twelve tribes? Because we know all mankind has come from a beginning, which is Adam. It kind of messes up theology a bit, doesn't it? <laughs> this is 144,000. They are spread across the earth. They are not in Israel. They are not in Jerusalem. Matter of fact, you are Israel. You are a part of Israel. Okay? We have to stop separating the old covenant and the new and understand God has one covenant, one purpose, one plan that never changed. Amen. It wasn't that this one failed and this one didn't. No, that one never failed. Jesus is the fulfillment of a perfect covenant. So James addresses the people, the 12 tribes. That's you, scattered abroad. You can think on that one. All Jews have been scattered abroad around the world. With all my research, I can only find James is actually addressing a Gentile audience, not even a Jewish audience. But even if he was, it makes no difference. Mm. Romans 2, verse 28. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Then you are heirs according to his promise. Awesome. Mm. That sort of squashes it right there. Revelation 7 lists the 12 tribes of which all of mankind originate from. When they scattered into the earth, all of mankind originate from these 12 tribes. I'll teach more on this sometime, but we, I don't have time today. This outpouring will be a suddenly moment. It'll be suddenly for most people, but not for this 144,000. They already know when it's going to happen. They know what's going to happen. They know the time. Everything God has already spoken to them in that secret place. This is not going to be a surprise for them. They're just going to obey him and wait. Wait. Until this happens. There is a waiting period. I've been saying this for some time now. Some of us have got impatient. There is a waiting period. Why? Because he wanted to pull us into that secret place. That secret place, because he has a massive job for each one of you. Massive job. Amen. The first assignment will be to those. I'm going to give you a little bit of insight to the assignment to these leaders. They've already got their assignment. <coughs> their first assignment is first in Jerusalem. In other words, first in their own backyard. Who is Jerusalem? 
the church, Old and New Covenant, is the New Jerusalem. Jerusalem is your backyard. Jesus gave very strict instructions to his apostles. Wait. Do not go anywhere. Do not do anything. Do not preach. Wait until you have been endured with power from on high. This is not speaking in tongues. This power is stuff that will blow out water. Just whatever you command will happen. This is power that you saw in the early church magnified many times over. Wait for this. You're going to receive this. This was the instruction. But then he went on straight after that and he said, Then you shall be my witnesses first in Jerusalem. And then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. There is an order that this 144,000 and all of us for that matter have been given the same commandment. Our, our, our commission is our first, our families, our friends, those who God has placed around us in our workplace, those who God places around us in the coffee shop or wherever we go, whatever we do. You're going to carry something that is going to change these people's lives and turn them upside down. Amen. So the commission is wait. There's a very strict commission here not to go to the Samaritans and not to go to the Gentiles. You know what I'm referring to, the scripture. Okay, who was the Gentiles, who was the Samaritans? The unbelievers. So here's another key here. The first commission is for the church. To the church. Hmm. To the church. That is the first commission. Do hmm. not try and go and win the lost. When the household of Israel was the commandment given. Mm. That's the first commission. Mm. This is the commission given in this outer come. Mm. Those of you who have already got that stirring in your heart for some time, it's the, it's the church that I've got to reach. Now yes. this will sit with you and you'll understand why. Mm. Do not go to the Gentiles and the Samaritans to start with. There's coming a time, of course, we know that will happen. But first, the church. Why? Because the church needs to change. The church needs to become the witness that Christ died for. Not a false witness. Not a whore. A Babylon. But the church that he died for. And their testimony will be of a supernatural encounter with God these 144,000 and this encounter is ongoing it, it wasn't a one-off it, it's an ongoing process where God is speaking to them and giving them direction and going ahead of them in every situation the spiritual eyes of the people will be open please keep in mind these leaders who are sealed and not the only ones at this time who are winning the lost. Please don't think it's only about certain people. It's not. Matter of fact, I'd just like to throw something in. I get a revelation wherever I am. I'm walking to my car to come here. The Lord gives me a revelation. Now, if you're a bit mathematics and I'm not, try and work this one out. There's a population on this earth of how many people? Is it seven or eight billion? Somewhere around there. Okay. Oh, where am I going to go with this? There's 144,000 called out ones, sealed. If you divide that into the population of the world, you're going to end up with somewhere between 48 to 50,000 per person. That is who God has entrusted to that yeah. leader. Somewhere around that figure. 48 yeah. to 50,000 people. Mm. So you can see you're going to be very busy. <laughs> Because you're a part of this. I'm just giving you some numbers here because I love numbers. God does too. He's very numerical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just as the 12 apostles were not the only one, however, they were the chosen ones who helped, protected, guided the people at that time from the destruction that had come upon the earth. The warning is this. Do not fall out of the chain of command. Know what command, what your command is, what your part in the chain of command is, and don't fall out of it. Don't try and run ahead and do stuff for God. This is God's business now. We're in his season, 217. 
we have to follow his command. And then everything is going to happen for you. Nothing will be done in the flesh. You won't be worrying about your children, granddaughter. What... <laughs> Just your mere presence is going to drive out every demon in their body. That's how it's going to work. When Peter walked down the street, the demons fled out of their bodies. People were healed. And the Bible says the glory of the latter will be greater than that. So it gives you some insight into how much power is coming on this timing of God at the specific time. And the spoils are for everyone. They're for all the church. And the only way to get them is by following God's leading through the Rima word. There is going to be a great, great harvest. The church, as we know it, is going to try and reap from that and will not succeed until they obey God's word. Because of the volume of people that will navigate this wilderness period, it is vital for swift obedience in the chain of command. Do not resist instruction to obey God's word. Do not reason God's word. I'm not talking about man's word, God's word. And if, if, if you're under or with that particular leader that God has placed with you or, or, or over you, align everything he says with the word of God. But if it's right, don't resist it. Because in this season, that resisting will cost you everything. Mm -hmm. Literally. You will end up dying in the wilderness. Because for those who will not obey, they will be left behind. This is what the Holy Spirit gave me yesterday. It was a harsh word. Do not turn back. Do not turn back for those that will not obey the word of God in this season. That means if it's your children, your husband, your wife, your friends, you have to place them on the altar. Do not turn back. It will cost you everything. The spoils of the promised land are for your eternal reward and my eternal reward. Once we enter the season of the promised land, the spoils, God has given you the promised land. The spoils are for you. And that is your eternal reward. How awesome. It doesn't matter how much we have failed in the past. And I say that reverently. You have a season ahead of you where you can enter in and take a harvest with you into heaven. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Because most of us have blown it, if we're being honest. Mm. And this short season of spoils runs for three and a half years, 3.5 years. It parallels exactly with the ministry of Jesus Christ himself. His ministry ran for three and a half years only. That was the season of his ministry, 3.5 years. That is the season of this ministry that is going to be so important for you and me. Three and a half years. God's kingdom of righteousness, joy and peace will be established in these few short years with his bride. Mm -hmm. With his bride. Mm -hmm. Parallel to that, the earth's kingdom of evil, sorrow and war will march parallel with that. Evil, sorrow and war. The period of time leading up to the three and a half years is the season you're in right now. You're in what's known in the Bible as the gestation period. There's roughly 40 weeks until this happens. September of 2017, where God gives us the most wonderful sign that nobody who will open their eyes can laugh at. And that is the sign in the heavens that the Apostle John saw. And he said, I saw a great wonder in the heavens. That of a woman clothed and arrayed. And above her head was twelve stars. Twelve, yet again. Hmm. And we know the scripture, I won't read it, but she gives birth to a child. That woman is the church. Beside her 
is the great dragon that is so angry because of what's just happened at that time. He flicks a third of the stars to the earth. Those stars signify angels. As we all know, a third of the angels were cast out of heaven. The book of Ezekiel, we can see that. But the second heaven is their territory as well as this earth. And God throws them out. Satan is so angry, he sends all of his troops to the ground. And an onslaught of Satan starts to happen at this time. There is a mass spiritual battle going on from this period for three and a half years. Like we have never encountered. You think you've had it tough? Forget it. You need to laugh at that. This is going to be something you have never encountered. That's why you have to be out of the wilderness in this season. Otherwise, the Bible says men's hearts are going to fail them because of fear of what's coming upon the earth. Mm. You will not be able to cope with this if you're still in the wilderness at this time. Mm. <coughs> Amen. So we're in this period of 40 weeks leading up to this now. What changes do I need to make for this journey through the wilderness. Some of us are near the end by the River Jordan. <laughs> We're just waiting. We're just waiting for the shutters to come down and take off through that river. And some of us are still stuck in the wilderness. Now, praise God, I've seen so much happening within our own group, people's lives, so much change. It looks bad on the outward, but I want to tell you it's wonderful. What's happening in the lives of people at the moment is wonderful. God is preparing each person. Do not look at the natural signs. What preparation do I need to make individually for this journey? What preparation do we need to make corporately? I don't really want to answer the second one yet because I don't think the timing is correct. But individually, I will answer. Now, that none of that was my message, by the way. That was what the Holy Spirit gave me last night. So I, I won't keep on with my message for too long, because otherwise you'll have information overload. But I'll give you a little bit of it. My message today was, Why Are You Naked? It's a good title. Why are you naked? And I'm not pointing that at anyone here. It's just the title of my message. Why are you naked? Mm -hmm. Unity is such a powerful force mm. for both good and evil. Unity. Without unity, nothing can be done. Nothing. When man aligns with God's word, he has the backing of heaven behind him. And he has the provision of heaven behind him. And he has the protection of heaven behind him. Unity is everything. Unity for good or evil is everything. The problem with Satan's kingdom is it's not in unity. It's a mess. Whereas God's kingdom is unified. And when we try to ne negotiate unity, in other words, when we try to compromise God's word, division takes over in our life. We only have to compromise just a little. I, I don't need to tithe, really. That's old covenant. We have compromised on truth. Why? Because we think we know better than God's word. So when we compromise, we're out of unity with each other, but more so we're out of unity with heaven. So unity is everything in this hour. Mm. And a house divided against itself cannot stand, the word of God says. So what divides the house is one person who will not align with God's truth. Nine months now, I've been focusing our group on preparing for his coming. As a matter of fact, that's why originally we were going to call ourselves the Bride of Christ. Then we decided not, that that's actually the commission, is to reach the Bride of Christ, to prepare the Bride of Christ. Hmm. The reason I focus, just keep pumping the Word of God the way I have these, these prophetic messages is to bring us into a place of unity because we've got to be ready for what's coming. This is a, a strong warning. Please take heed of what I'm saying. We must be in unity before the season and anything less than unity I'm not willing to pursue. Uh, I've seen the fallout 
of some who would not unify with the word of God. I've seen the damage already in amongst our brethren. My message has been solely focused on this purpose and for a good reason. The Holy Spirit showed me some time back, quite a long time ago, what qualifies someone to be part of the Bride of Christ. I know the qualifier. What tell, Jesus tells the story there of the ten virgins waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. We know the story. Five are wise, five are foolish. But most overlook the qualifier. What was it? Five were wise. Five were foolish. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The fear of his word is what made five wise. Mm. The foolish did not have fear of God's word. They didn't have the fear of God. Mm. If you look around today, has the church got the fear of God? Predominantly, I think you can answer that yourself. Mm. Five were wise because they trusted the word of God and obeyed it. The fear of the Lord, Proverbs 9, the beginning of wisdom. That fear is a respect, is an awe. It's an obedience to God's word. And it makes the time to spend with the Lord. And I really want to get that in today to each of us. Make the time. Make the time. Make this your highest priority from here on in. Make the time to seek the Lord. Be honest with him. Cry out to him. Say, Lord, teach me. Let me hear what you're saying. Human beings are called sheep for a reason. Without sounding rude, I know, because I was a shepherd. Sheep just follow. We've got to stop that in the church. Don't just follow me. Don't follow any man. Follow the word of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. The church has followed man for, for, for too long, and because of that, often the blind has led the blind. And both have ended up trapped. Paul said, talking about the Bereans, he, he, he said, these people were wise. Why? Because they took what they heard and they studied it out. Mm -hmm. We need to learn. 2 Corinthians 2.15, we all know it's study to show yourself approved. A workman that is not ashamed. Powerful scripture we've all quoted probably dozens of times. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you a revelation with it. Ashamed of what? Ashamed of what? Study to show yourself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed. Ashamed of what? So if we look into Revelation, we'll see what that shame is. In chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is the one that stays awake and remains clothed, lest he be found naked. I know what it is to be found naked in an earthquake when you've had to run and you've got no clothes on. It's very shameful. Well, the same thing here. This is what happens. When he comes... Blessed is he that will not be found naked. What does it mean to be clothed? To be clothed in the robe of righteousness. Mm -hmm. The robe that's been bathed in the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. That has driven out every sin. Mm -hmm. When Jesus comes, many will be found naked. Not wearing the wedding garment. And we all know you can't get into the wedding without the garment. Revelation 3.17, but you say, I am rich. I don't need of anything. This is the church of today's hour, the church of Laodicea. But you don't know. This is Jesus talking. You are wretched. You are pitiful. You are poor. You are blind. You are naked. Stern words for the church of this hour. Mm -hmm. We need to take it serious. Amen. It's amazing we follow school teachers. We follow our boss. We follow a pastor or whomever. But most will not follow God's word. Mm. They will just go and listen to someone, espouse their version of God's word, and live off that. 
and that becomes their food. And most of the time that food is already dead and stale and of no value because it's not fresh manna for today. People are following what they will accept rather than the truth. The modern church has learned how to use this for their advantage, sadly, huh? by accepting compromise to keep its people. They've used this for their advantage. This naked church has used this for its advantage as a compromise. Why? Because it becomes a business and I need to keep the people to keep the business functioning. Mm -hmm. Let me give you the bridal checklist. I will wrap this up soon because I know I've been talking a while. The bridal checklist is things that we need to check with ourselves. Are we ready? Don't put this down as legalism. Put it down as the word of God. Number one, pay off financial debts. The Bible says, oh no man, nothing. Romans 13 verse 8. Pay off financial debts. Do not be found in error on this when Jesus comes. Sin will stop. What we must understand is he's coming back for a spotless bride without wrinkle. A bride without sin, in other words. If we've got debts, those listening to this, get rid of them quickly. What is a debt? I don't want to start teaching on money today, but a debt is not a mortgage. A debt is a debt when it's not paid. In other words, you don't pay your mortgage on time, it's a debt. You don't pay your credit card off, pay your whatever, it's a debt. Anything that goes over the space of a lot of time becomes a debt. Number one, pay off financial debts. Number two, pay off unforgiveness debts. Get rid of all unforgiveness debts, whether it's you or somebody against you. You need to be sure that you have done your part to reconcile. You cannot change that person, but you can do your part to reconcile. Number three, make restoration where needed. Number four, pay your tithes. I know that most of you are doing it here, but for some who are listening, they may not be. You say that's not important. The Bible says, will a man rob God? Amen. That's sinning. When you rob God, God will give you the consequence of robbing him. Number five, give any excess to the poor and those in need. Matter of fact, Jesus tells a story, I can't put my finger on, is it at Luke 12 or something like that, and man, that he hears the gospel and, 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 and it's just so wonderful to him and he's so over the moon about it, he gives half of what he's got to the poor. He's a wealthy man. Well, my thoughts on this are, what's the point of having it when Jesus is coming back soon anyway? There is no point in sitting on a lot of assets. There is no point in storing up for tomorrow. There is no point. It's not biblical for one. If you read the Bible about this hour to come, what is the point of having a lot of assets, a lot of money in the bank, when it should be used to advance the kingdom of God? Please don't think I'm driving at anyone here. I'm not. This applies to me and you. This is the word of God. Either we believe the word of God or we don't. If we don't, then we're going to hold on to everything we've got tightly. Mm. I told you that I have to bring the truth. <laughs> Make out a will, number six. Make out a will. Make sure you've made out a will. Why? You say, well, it doesn't matter, I won't be here. It does. The government will get everything of yours otherwise. Leave it somehow in a trust or something to, to whomever that you want to bequeath that to or whatever because there will be people here in that time a lot that know the truth but we're not ready and they will need money at that time to get through that time they will need help they'll need support they'll need leadership it costs money make out a will in my own family there is some that at this stage are not walking with the Lord. I don't know whether they'll be ready before the Lord comes back. If I judge it in the natural, I'd say there's no way. But God is a great God. 
but we can't hang our hat on that is going to happen. We have to be wise. And it's biblical to leave up, store up for your children's children, the Bible says. So we need to leave everything in order for when he comes. My grandmother used to go to bed at night and she'd never leave a dish in the sink because she'd say, what if the Lord comes? <laughs> now that's a bit of an extreme, but, but, but we need to have our household in order in every area. So, um, now what does this mean? I just want to give a couple of examples. I think this is important before I wrap up. For some, getting our house in order may mean that I say this for the ones that are listening to this tape. It may mean we've got married. Before marriage, we had an intimate relationship with our now wife. We took that sin into the marriage and didn't deal with it. Or in some cases, we asked God's forgiveness, but we didn't ask our partner's forgiveness. It's still a sin in God's sight until that's dealt with. And this is what causes most marriages to reverse, by the way. When you see a woman leading the man, this is usually the reason why. This sin of, of, of not repenting to each other for that is still alive in that marriage. Even I've asked God's forgiveness, got nothing to do with it. That's only part of the story. You've got to ask each other's forgiveness. That's the be forgiveness has to come out of the heart too. So this is something we need to address the Bible says the three-stranded cord is not easily broken. The devil cannot penetrate your life or my life unless there's a door open. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. So if our marriage is in a mess, the reason is the devil's in there. There's a door open. Real simple. We need to look at the door. What is the door? And close the door. That's called repentance. Amen? Amen. Number two, it could be that I've not asked my children forgiveness because... That sin is affecting their lives or can affect their lives in the future. It is a sin to not go to my child and say, forgive me for I've allowed sin in my life to affect your life. We need to shut the doors on sin. Number three, maybe I've allowed fear to stop me standing up for the truth. These are just examples. Number four, maybe I've not obeyed God with my finances. In Genesis 11, we see the story of the Tower of Babel getting built. And we see that even God says, they were so unified. If I don't mess this thing up, they're going to reach heaven. <laughs> so God messed it all up and they become disunified and they start speaking another language. They don't understand each other. And that's really a powerful concept because we've got to realize that the church predominantly is speaking another language that God doesn't understand. We've got to speak the right language. It's his word. So the language God gave them became a different language. The language God has given the church today has become a different language. Why? And you can see the fruit of it. It's called disunity. You can see the division in the church. That's why the language is all messed up. They're speaking a different language than God. And whilst they spoke one language, they had to do the ability to do anything they wanted. They were one mind. But when God messed up that thing, their project collapsed. The story of the church for 6,000 years. Acts 1.14, on the day of Pentecost. Sorry, they were all together. Sorry, Acts 1.14, they're all together in one accord in prayer and supplication. Oh, that's what we need to do more. Come together and pray in supplication and unity. Acts 2, uh, sorry, Acts 1.16. They were all together in one accord and were not afraid to make wrongs right with each other. Powerful scripture. We just overlook so much of this. Yes. This is all preparation for this day that I'm talking about. Mm. And often when a group is seeking the Lord for revival and the Holy Spirit reveals hidden sin that needs to be dealt with, instead of unifying with the word of God on the matter, the sinner breaks unity and goes off and does his own thing. 
And we think, praise the Lord, they're doing great things for God. And the truth is they've broken unity with God, trying to do their own thing. We need to be wise in this hour. What's happening? On the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one accord. Yes. Unity. Mm -hmm. Unity. And where there's unity, there God's going to command the blessing. Where there's unity, there's power. Where there's unity, wherever you go, I'm with you and you're with me. We are one accord. We are together. When you pray, that prayer is holding me up when I go out in that day. And if we want revival in our own life, we must allow the Holy Ghost to shine His light on each one of us and humble ourselves to unify to God's Word, whatever that may be. Nothing can stop a people in unity. Nothing can stop a people in one accord. This unity is the single weapon that stop God power from manifesting. It's the single satanic weapon that destroys the power of God. Disunity. When we try to introduce our own beliefs and they violate God's word, disunity comes. When we speak a different language, the snake in the garden spoke a different language. God doesn't really mean what he says. Disunity, the first weapon he uses. What language am I speaking today? What language are you speaking today? The system of unity is what's going to usher in this great end time move. How united is the United Nations? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> they don't seem to have much effect on the earth, do they? Well, it's clearly why. They're not unified. And you see, when you have a voting system that's called democracy, but the problem with democracy, it's not a theocracy, and God has a theocracy, and that's what I say goes. It's really simple. Me, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And you want to argue with me and do it your way, you're working against me. So disunity. I think I'd better wrap it up here. I'm probably not even halfway through this. Uh, the best is yet to come. It really is. There's, the rest of the message is full of revelation. Um, if I can close it off here. What is the greatest sign of Jesus' coming? I just want to leave this with you to take home and dwell on for the week. Jesus gave one sign that eliminates every other sign. Some would say, well, it must be earthquakes and famine and war. And no, that's not, that's not what he said. He said there will be that. Don't be deceived. This is not a sign of my coming. This is only the birth pains or the beginning of my coming. This is the season, 217, we're coming into. You're going to see this escalate. Sorrows, famine, pestilence, war. But this is not the sign of his coming. He gives one sign in the Olivet Discourse. He gives a direct answer to that question when he was asked it. I'm going to sign off with this. The single sign of Jesus' coming is deception in the church. Deception in the church, the violation of his temple. False Christianity is going to grow much worse. Don't pacify it. Don't play with it. Jesus says, many will be deceived by those claiming to represent him. Many will say, I am the Christ. Should read in correct translation, I am anointed. Many will say that. He said, don't be deceived by that. The exact same parallel is in Revelation 6 with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first horseman is a rider on a white horse, bringing false peace to the earth, false religion. And that is a parallel sign of what Jesus is talking about. The first sign, the only sign, is deception in this hour. Deception to the believer, deception in the church. Stay close to the Lord. 
press into Him. Give Him more time in your life. I can't say any more than that. It's the most important thing in our lives now to press into that secret place, mm. to hear His voice and to recognize that He is working on my life because He loves me. Mm. Father, we thank You for this part of Your Word. Oh, how I would have loved to have given it all, Lord. I feel like I've left a brethren hanging, but Lord, we'll pick it up. I pray that you use what I've given so far to stir us. Lord, to challenge us, to prepare us. Father, I thank you that one can put a thousand to flight and two can put ten thousand to flight. And if there was only 10 of us, that means we can put 50,000 to flight. Amen. Praise God. 50,000, that wonderful number, Lord, that divides into the population of the world and the 144,000, 50,000. 10 people can change a city, a big city. Lord, we know you're raising up in this hour your people for your purpose and your plan. We only look to you. We're not driven by other people. We're not driven by even myself, Lord. We're driven only by you and your word. Let your word sink in our hearts. Holy Spirit, I pray you stir us all week with this message. That you have prepared a people and are preparing a people for this hour for your glory. Let us not be found wanting in anything, Lord. I pray for my brethren that whatever area needs to be corrected, Holy Spirit, shine a light on it. Make us aware of what that is. Let us not be proud and think that we're perfect. Let us not think that we have no faults, Lord. Shine the light on our faults, on any area of our life that is not in keeping with your word and aligned with your word. Lord, prepare us that we may be found the spotless bride without wrinkle. Thank you for the privilege of this hour, Lord. We love you. We want to honor you. We ask forgiveness for any baggage that we've carried through this week. And we lay it now at the cross, Lord. Amen. Amen. To be
Father, we uh, we just worship you. We we confess, Father, our complete dependence on you, Father. May may we fix our eyes upon Jesus, Father, and may the things of this world fade away, Father. And we just pray that the crux of this message, Father, that we spend time in your presence, Father, that you have a fresh word for each one of us every day that differs. Yes. It's going to be a different word for each one of us, Father, and if we don't spend time with you, we're not going to receive that word, Father. And here in front of us, Father, we've got the word made flesh. We've got representation of the word made flesh in front of us, Father. Your body and your blood. And Father, we're going to eat and drink this, Father, but the spiritual meaning, Father, is that we we, we need we need presence, Father. We need your body. We need your blood. We need Jesus, the Word made flesh. We need the Word, Father. And so, as we eat and drink this, Father, may our prayer be to you. May our prayer before you, Father, is that we draw close to, to your Word, Father which is symbolized by the blood and the body. about taking communion, Father, in a, in a manner that's unworthy, Father. And really, it's it's in a manner where we don't take sin seriously and we don't examine our lives, Father, and, and confess and repent, Father, from any anything in our lives. Father, so right now, Father, the things that, that your Holy Spirit was speaking and convicting us of when we heard the message that you gave us through Martin, Father. We we just, and each one of us, I'm sure, has different things, Father. I just, uh, we just want to spend a moment, Father, uh, confessing and repenting of those things. Father, we do this in remembrance of uh, your glorious power that was mm. demonstrated mm. in Egypt, mm. Father, when uh, you instructed the children of Israel, Father, 
to take a lamb and and uh, an unblemished lamb, Father, mm. and, and to kill it and to apply the blood on the door mm. of their home, Father, uh, for protection yes. against the angel of death. Yes. And we just praise you and thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus. And we, and we, we, we claim the protection from the angel of death, Father. And mm. may we draw close to you. Father, we, we just pray for an anointing this week, Father, that in our quiet time we will enter that secret place of the Most High, Father. Mm. And we give you permission to examine us and cleanse us, Father, Amen. that we will be uh, vessels of honor yes. where all dishonor, all impurities have been removed from our vessels, Father, so that you can use us, yes. Father, that your glory would fill us up, Father. And, and go before us, Father, and, and and do battle, Father. We're waiting. We're waiting. Mm. We won't move Amen. until we are endued from power on high. Amen. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. Amen. Father, we just forgive our brothers and sisters, Lord, with um, Sister Maggie and Sister Sandra, Lord, and mm. Brother Bruce, mm. and all our family is spread out, oh God. And we take communion together to remind them this is the blood of Jesus that's been done. Yes. That's been um, laid all on the cross and remembering that it is finished. The Lord says, mm. but because of our disobedience, Lord, Father, we thank you mm. that you bring us in remembrance, as your word said. Yes. Put this in remembrance to know, O oh God, mm. that mm. you have paid a price for us. Amen. You love the world so much by sending yes. him to do thank this for Jesus. us. So we're so grateful. Mm. Thank you. Sickness and disease that are attacking each one of us, Lord, Amen. It is the blood of Jesus has already set us free. Amen. We decree yes. and claim our healing mm. and our everything that you did for us. Amen. Jesus. 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 Mm.